to have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200-inch box? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. It sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? Got a brand new Eastman's Elevated for you. So today on the podcast, I have on my buddy Scott Reekers. So Scott lives over in, in Powell, Wyoming, works at the Eastman's office over there, and uh, I talk to Scott probably once a week. Seems like our conversations always drift towards mule deer, and today is no different. Scott's a mule deer fanatic, just like I'm a mule deer fanatic, and we get talking about these tough-to-hunt seasons, these late seasons, uh, the the pre-rut seasons. We talk about hunting high pressure, talk about some of the tactics that work for us hunting these areas. Uh, from there, we start talking about our application strategies, which is coming up. Uh, everybody's season starting to wind down, and so we talk about the different opportunities, uh, the the different state agencies, and and how to find these these quality hunts out west for these low points or um, you know how to find these blue chip units as well. So made for a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. I think you guys will enjoy it too. I want to thank today's sponsor, Zamberlin Boots. Uh, Zamberlin makes great boots. They just don't cut any corners when it comes to their material, when it comes to their construction, and they're honestly the best boots I've ever owned. So uh, they made a tennis shoe this year. So I don't think they made it specifically for me, but it feels like it's made for me. So it's a burlier tennis shoe. And tennis shoes, they stock and hunt really well. Uh, but these are made with a Vibram sole, so all of a sudden you can side hill, and, and they're built to take the abuse that us hunters put on them. I've been using mine for an entire season. In fact, I'm wearing them right now. I wore them to work today, and, and I'm still yet to wear them out. Uh, they're, they're just really durable, well-constructed, lightweight, and um, waterproof. And I love hunting in these things. So I've been using those all season. They're called their 215 Saluth GTX RR. If you like hunting in tennis shoes, these are the best ones made. Uh, I also like their their boots, uh, and they have, like, a lot of boots is personal preference uh, of what you like, what you like to hike in, and, and boots can almost propel you down the trail. Uh, they're, they're made a little bit stiffer, and um, they help with uh, not so much calf fatigue. They help with side healing. They help in gnarly terrain, and so the boots that I really like are the 320 Trail Light Evo GTXs. They're a low-cut boot, uh, so they're made lightweight. They're under three pounds. Those shoes I mentioned are under two pounds, so super lightweight, especially when a, a pound on the foot is like 10 on the back. Uh, but those low height boots are great for gnarly terrain. They're great for my high country mule deer hunts. Uh, they're great for if I'm putting on a ton of miles so uh, I don't see any foot fatigue uh, or anything like that. But just um, great boots. I really like them. Again, those are the 320 Trail Light Evo GTXs. If you're in the market for a new boot, make sure to check out Zamberlin. Just great products. I also want to thank Eastman's for their support of the podcast. Check out everything we do over at Eastman's. Uh, you can check out our Beyond the Grid or Internet TV show. Check us out on Eastman's Hunting TV on the Outdoor Channel. And, of course, our magazines, Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal, Eastman's Hunting Journal. Uh, you can get a promo code to those by punching in Elevated321 and receive both magazines and an Outdoor Edge knife for $50. Also, make sure to check out TagHub. TagHub is our internet research tool, uh, so it compiles all this data, and you'll hear us talk about it in the podcast today, but just compiles all this data for hunting out west, for learning these units and, and seeing what's offered, for understanding their systems, and being able to take advantage of, of what's out there in all these western states. I've been using it for years, uh, and it's just a great resource for us western hunters. And with that, uh, let's get into this podcast. So um, this is uh, Scott Reekers, uh, my buddy over there at Eastman's. Uh, I'm your host, Brian Barney, Eastman's Elevated. Here we go. All right, I'm live here. I got my buddy Scott Reekers from Eastman's on. Um, Scott, how are you? I'm good. Uh, just living that November dream, heading into uh, – Heading into the fall and the holiday season, and after a busy hunting season. 
Yeah, good. Well, it's been a busy hunting season, I know. Um, a lot of your hunts this year took place in the later part of the season. A lot of times you're in for that early September 15th hunt. Uh, this year was a weird deal. Um, <laughs> and it was not something to take lightly either. It's uh, If you ever have had a skin infection, you'll know what I'm talking about. It was, it was the oddest deal. Brandon Mason and I went in mid-August and we did our... I've discovered in life that with how life has panned out for me, that it's easier to do one big scouting trip now rather than multiple little ones. um, Like what I used to do when I lived uh, closer to some of my honey holes. And so I'll go do a big one. So I go do this, this big scouting trip. Brandon and I actually found some really good bucks, but he had a really hard hunt when he actually went in there because I didn't get to go with him. And so I, I came back. And, um, it was kind of weird. I noticed this dry spot on my knee and I don't know what in the world is going on with it, but I just like, okay, that's okay. And so my, um, my scouting trip was pretty close to September and I did that on purpose. You know, I wanted to know what they were doing. And as bucks are, you know, finishing out and getting a little more hard horn, they're starting to behave like what they're going to be in the areas a little bit closer to where they're actually going to hide out if they go hard horned. Well, um, we get back and, I, I see this dry spot on my knee and I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll put some lotion on it. Then it, cause it kind of, and it started hurting a little bit too. I was like, what in the world? I hope something's not wrong with my knee. And by that next day, it was red. Uh, it was red and started swelling up. And, um, so that next Monday, which happened to be Labor Day, I called my doctor and he got me in and he took a look at it. And he's like, I'm almost positive this is cellulitis. So we're going to get you on some antibiotics and, so then the next day I go in and because I saw the doctor that was on call at our little, uh, it's like a subscription service doctor. And so I saw the one, um, saw the one who was on call. And then the next day I went to see the guy that I normally go see and switched up my antibiotics a little bit, but it was definitely getting worse and it kept getting worse. And so it was something called cellulitis and long story short, it took me a little while to, uh, to deal with that. And I decided it probably wasn't wise for me to go um, on my deer hunt with Brandon. And a um, good thing I did, because then on top of the skin infection, like the skin infection clears up and a day and a half later, I have a major reaction to the antibiotics. And so that was super awesome. Um, <laughs> you know, so my entire body felt like it was being uh, pricked by pins constantly. And so, um, it, it was just pretty miserable. So I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't go that week. And so I just, I said, okay, stop trying to figure out how to go the next week. And, and you've got several spots that you can go that about the turn of the month, um, where it turns off to are is some really good hunting and you would be better off just planning a trip, doing it right. And so that's what I ended up doing. I, called Scott Woodruff at um, Lander Llama Company, and he had llamas available for me. So I did that, and then I uh, sat down with Ike, and we got the camera guy and all that lined up and just planned like I was going then. And, you know, little bit by little bit, my <laughs> my wonderful reaction, um, you know, and if you've ever had a reaction to antibiotics, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It was uh, super pleasant, um, and it, like, showed up like hives all over um and so i little by little they disappeared over the course of that next little bit and i was ready to go for that next hunt and so that's kind of how my that's kind of how my my early fall played out glad i'm not a bow hunter because that really would have uh would have messed messed with my season nothing against bow hunters you know but um I didn't even get a laugh out of you on that. So. <laughs> you did. It was just under my breath. <laughs> um, dude, you're supposed to plan those sicknesses uh, uh, outside of hunting season. That was bad planning on your part. I, it, it, here's here's the craziest part about this. Like, Since we're all like Google doctor experts now, um, I, of course, I looked it up. And save yourself some agony. Don't look at the pictures that are associated with cellulitis. Mine looked nothing like that. Um, but one of the one of the things that it said is sometimes a reaction can happen inside your body where it actually gets worse when you start taking the antibiotics. And so that was pretty miserable um, to to deal with that. And so <laughs> I just 
it, it was just a crappy deal that it got worse b- before it started getting better from the treatment, which that was not pleasant. And I wish I could have planned this for a different time. Um, you know, it was a little stressful, I think on the, on the family too, cause you don't know what's going on. And, you know, and then, then you talk to some other people like military has this a lot. Like when they go through a lot of schools, a lot of guys will get it. Um, and so you, anybody can get it. Like it's literally the bacteria that lives on your skin. Um, and so it's just, and it's normally quote unquote, good bacteria. Anything that's creepy crawly to me, I'm not a big fan of. Um, but it was one of those things that literally it can happen to anybody at any time. Um, and it usually happens around a cut. Weirdest part was I didn't have a cut on my knee, anything like that. So who knows what happened, um, with that, but we got it all cleared up and then I ended up going on that, um, you know, early October hunt and got in there got in there at the tail end of September to do a few days of, of looking around first, you know, before I decided to pick out what buck I wanted. And so I was able to do that and it was good. Dude. So it was a good hunt. Oh, what a bummer. But yeah, it is, it is all perspective. It seems like, um, you know, that unplanned stuff just seems to pop up at the worst times, you know, like right the one week you're planning on leaving and going hunting, but it it is just a case of perspective and going, you know, this is more important. I yep. got to take care of myself. You know, my health is number one and yep. like being flexible, being able to reschedule yep. your hunt and uh, probably hunt a different area in October, I bet, huh? It was a completely different area, um, you know. Once the bucks go hard horn, their behavior really changes. And they intentionally set that September 15th opener for when most of the bucks should be hard horned. And so, you know, you'll see the occasional big deer with, um, with velvet, but I did not see a lot of September 15th velvet bucks this year. And I don't know this for a fact, but anecdotally, I really believe the bucks lose their velvet earlier in drought years. Um, and so, I, I do think this drought affected a lot of deer behavior. Um, I, I didn't see as many big bucks as what we normally do. There were some big smokers. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. There were a few that, that definitely came out of western Wyoming. Um, we're still seeing some on the migration hunts coming out, too. Um, but I, I think that that did affect things. And then drought on top of that will really – it really changes mule deer behavior in that I'm I'm convinced that in drought years – or when the, when the even when August is really dry, that it concentrates bucks in the areas with the best feed, where the last remaining moisture was, um, and a lot of guys get you know get hung up on they want to go where they found them in July or early August and they haven't been back in a month. Um, they they go in because I think that it's an advantage to go in. And learning to scout properly and understanding when and where those mule deer bucks will be um, at the right season or at the right point in the season. And the fact that you're, when you have a drought, it changes that behavior even more. It compounds it and moves them even into tighter spaces, um, changes things. Um, and so it's good for, and honestly, the only way you're going to get that, I can't act like that secret sauce. Honestly, the only way you're going to figure those things out is to just go watch a lot of mule deer and figure that out, especially in season. Um, I, I wish I could tell you exactly where they're going to be, but part of it is being able to hunt in a spot regularly and the continuity of knowing where they're going to be, knowing where you've seen bucks, and then knowing where they're going to shift to where the better feed is based on the on the time of year. Yeah. Yeah, spot on. I liked um I liked your your scouting approach too is scouting closer um to that September 15th opener and I I truly believe you're right. I think um you know not only is it the bucks shedding their velvet but it's also like the food burning off up high which changes their routines. And so like like you talking about that September 15th opener being intentional. I think you're right. I think also pressure affects these bucks, you know, and they start to get conditioned to that September 15th opener and the same way they're starting to get conditioned to September 1st to the 15th bow season as I'm finding them moving down into secondary living earlier and earlier in these places and so I'm not quite sure if it's the them shedding their velvet or if it's that that up high food source that's starting to dry out 
uh, where they move down. But yeah, I I think you're spot on. Like I think I see him start to move to secondary living, like somewhere in between that September 1st to September 10th. And it seems to me yep. that it that it happens earlier and earlier with the bow hunting pressure now to where yep. even when I'm going in September 2nd or September 4th, I'm not finding these things in the Alpen basins where I scouted them in August. It seems like they're moving yep. down into tighter spots and tighter cover. And they're, they're a lot tougher yep. to hunt in that country when they're not in that, those Alpen basins and you still see them. Yep. They still have to feed, but, um, man, they really tighten up their programs where they don't make themselves seen in daylight hours as much. It yep. seems like you get a chance at them, you know, in that first light or that last light, but during the middle of the day, they don't come out much, and they also, like, disappear in that deep, dark timber for the day. So, like, instead of, like, yep. bow hunting, we love to stalk them in their beds, but all of a sudden when they're in this secondary living, you don't get that chance because they disappear in this deep, dark timber, and so the game yep. that we start to play, you know, as, as bow hunters during the September season is to watch them disappear in the dark cover. And then we're trying to figure out where they're going to come out that night and trying to set up, but it's a, a way yeah. lower odds game than it is when you can stalk yep. them in their beds. And so like, I imagine that's what you're dealing with. Like you hunt a lot of those September 15th to 30th season. I know that's your money time. And those bucks are tough to hunt that time of year. You yep. really got to be diligent behind your glass. And you're you're not looking at those wide open alpen basins and formed a bed and a little group of trees. Like they're just, they're down in shoots and slides. And they're still in super extreme country and remote country, but they're just tougher to find and locate and get on. Yep. And um, that's kind of the, the techniques that you've, you've used over the years to consistently harvest bucks is getting good at hunting that secondary living. Well, and that's a last year's bucket. I don't know that you and I ever did a podcast last year. Did we talk about last year's bucket on one? I don't think on the podcast, but yeah, go ahead. Okay. So last year what happened um, – is Brandon and I went in with, um, with llamas and we found our, our spot and we had, we had scouted a lot of deer. I had crazy, you know, I know a lot of people are going to doubt me when I say this based on numbers or what they saw, but I had legitimate, um, what four shooters that I'd have been really proud of and a couple that were really top notch. Um, and so, any one of those I would have been okay with, but there was one that I really wanted. He, he was a really big deer. And so, um, it's, it, it was a challenge in that I found three out of four of them, um, before opening day. And, um, we, we got in there and there wasn't much pressure, but there was just enough that it changed some things and all the bucks had gone hard horned. So they started moving closer to that heavier timber to the secondary ridges. And so I went in and I had to go hunt tight country where I could, I could only see, you know, usually when you're, when you're up high and you're, you're on, on the top, you can see for miles, you know, so maybe I was looking at a thousand square yards, you know, or like a thousand yards away from me and then around, um, you know, like the, which isn't much country, but I knew there were deer in there. I, I found 10 bucks that morning, you know, a bunch of the little ones. I didn't find any of the shooters, you know, and then Brandon called me on the radio and told me that he had found a bunch of the shooters that we had looked for. Um, one of which was, I'm actually I'm sitting in my garage and I'm staring at him. Um, it was a big framed three by three, um, you know, put, and, you know, so one of the things that I've, I've kind of done and anyone who's watched the a couple of, or the beyond the grid episodes kind of knows this about me. I just want big and mature. Um, I don't necessarily chase score. Um, score is a, to me, score is a great reference, but man, I like chasing the old bucks and I like big frames. I just like impressive when they look at you. Um, and so Brandon showed me the video that he got of this buck. Cause when we had gone scouting, we hadn't gotten much video of this particular buck. And I said, okay, I'll shoot him later in the week. But there was a really big three by four that we had seen head that direction too. And I said, that's the one that I, I kind of want to concentrate on finding. So let's see if we can get him. Um, 
then I saw this three by three and I, I sat there staring at him and looked at him. And I was like, you know what? I need to, um, I need to get, get, get on this buck if I can. And I need to do it. So we sat and I actually sat and dry fired at this hill because he crossed where there's a patch of trees in the middle of it that he worked up through and fed up through. Then he crossed the second opening um, into the back into the trees into some thick timber. And he did this every day. Like it was right at seven fifteen every morning he did this. Um and then he did it in the evening too, at about five o'clock, oddly enough, before those dark hours. Um and once I committed to kill him, um, I dry fire on this hill and it was a, just a little bit close to the edge of the distance I'm comfortable shooting, and then on top of that, he was kind of moving just a little bit. Um and so I was like, Nope, I can't do it. I, I just, I wasn't comfortable with the shot. And, you know, when you're like, I will not shoot farther than 500 yards and I was pushing that edge. And so uh, I said, Nope, I'm not going to do that. And so we waited until the next morning and he never showed up first time in three days. He did not follow his routine. Um, and so then we waited all day long. And then that night um, he actually showed up further up the drainage, but um, Brandon, myself and Hunter, our camera guy, we kind of spread out on the ridge um, to be able to look over more country. And about the time that Brandon, I see Brandon kind of working his way through the trees back to me. And I'm already heading there because I saw the buck and I get set up and I shoot him at 332 yards. He's coming, he's coming down a, a trail. And so I knew when he was going to step out past this little tree and I, and then I hammered him. Um, and so that episode actually got turned into an episode of beyond the grid um, and so that's, um, that's up on Eastman's YouTube channel. And so it was a really fun hunt. He was actually in full velvet when I shot him until he, uh, rolled down, down the rock slide that he was in. And then he also, uh, he took out about a pop can sized tree, um, believe it or not, like knocked it clean over when he, when he fell. Um, and I, I, stupid me, I didn't get a picture of it. There was actually like a hole in his back that looked about the size of a pop can from where he, he like stuck that stump. <laughs> so it was pretty funny um, that he did that. So it was really steep country um, where he, where he died, but it was definitely secondary country. It is not um, where I had seen him in, um, in late August. He was in a lush chute that had flowing water while well, the water had quit flowing. So of course he moved it over. Plus he went to a spot that was going to have less pressure. It, it's a hard hill to hunt. Um, it's not an easy spot where you're just going to see deer and, you know, like you'll have to sit there all day to see them and pick them out. And so, um, that was, that was fun. It was a fun hunt to, to be a part of. And, um, you know, he, he was a, he was probably the biggest body buck, um, I've ever shot my, my buck in 2013 might be close, but this guy was just big. Like he was, he, he was just a tank of a deer. And then plus his, his frame was real impressive. Um, his back, like his, I can't say his backs, like they, they actually, I'm six foot five. And so in pictures of it, you can see that it actually runs almost the length of my back. Um, so just a big frame, you know? And so I'm, I'm pretty happy with that buck still. It's a, still a pretty fun story because when Brandon and I hunt together, we've got a, re a track record of success. And so we were able to keep that going. Um, you know, whether it's a couple of the bulls that, um, that he and I've killed together, you know, and we've both been shooters, um, when, when we killed some pretty good elk. And then also, you know, like we now we've killed that, we killed that deer together and he's killed some animal with his bow with me. So it's a lot of fun to be able to hunt with him and have those stories. So that's my, that was my 2020 buck. It was a, it was a really good trip. Dude, that's super cool. Yeah, you and Brandon make a good team. Um, he's such a good guy. I'm sure he makes a good hunting partner as well. But good discipline yeah. on your part like that. I loved um, your dry fire practice on that hillside. Like, um, you know, making a rifle shot is not an automatic. And you do a good job of yep. um, anchoring these bucks and putting good shots on them. But it's not a gimme. And it's not a gimme like your max no. distance is 500 yards. But, you know, a 300-yard shot is a tough shot. Yep. And so... 
you know, it's something as a rifle hunter, you can't walk around and think things are going to be automatic. Like you have to, that dry fire practice is, is so crucial. And also like shooting positions are so crucial, like how you're going to get your rest and how you're going to get your back elbow anchored, or are you going to, can you get a prone position? And in that steep country, you can't always get prone on those shots, you know, so good on you. And then um, what great discipline, like passing up that shot towards your max distance of 500 yards. And I, you know, I can just imagine what happened was, is you had him in the scope and it was swimming. Like you just were not steady on him yep. or you knew if yep. you were going to uh, uh, jerk that trigger, or try to pull off a shot that you were going to miss, you know? And so what great discipline yep. and, and could have been the difference of you killing that deer or not, because if you would have shot yep. and missed that 500 yard shot, you may have never seen that buck again. Um, so I, I thought that was pretty cool as well. And then, yeah, I also like, just as you're describing this hunt and this secondary living, it just reminds me like the tight country that they get in, like all of a sudden the master vantage points aren't as good. Like you, you can't find a vantage point that overlooks all this terrain because just like you were saying, that that buck finds more cover, like where he's not going to get pressured by guys during that general rifle season where there's a lot of orange pressure in there. You know, there's a lot of uh, yep. uh, guys hunting during that general rifle season. And so they find tighter country where they're just not as easy to glass. Like uh, you, you can't find a country that looks over miles. Instead, you're having to hike down these secondary ridge lines and look at just one canyon that you can see, like you described. And then you yep. had Brandon in another canyon that, you know, actually found the bigger bucks, you know, that first day that you were describing. But you almost have to dive into tighter country and commit to looking at one drainage and look at it till absolutely last light or at first light in in those critical yep. hours where you see those things like you you have to commit to that drainage and then if you don't see him there you can move on you know once you've sat a vantage or like a like a time or two uh uh during those that that gray gray light hours but um just so many things that you did right on that hunt that i wanted to highlight because hunting them in secondary living is not easy but uh man it sounds like a super cool hunt and um I'm with you, like a, a big mature buck. Like I just got done, you know, with this hunt I do out eastern Montana. And to tell you the truth, like a like a big deer out there, it's a big prairie deer, but a big deer out there goes 160 inches, even though he can be five to seven years old. And that gets me yep. excited. Like I like hunting big deer, but I like seeing those big bodies and that big belly hanging down and big chest and Roman nose. And you can just kind of tell it's an older deer. And those older deer just get me excited no matter what they score. It, exactly. And it's, you know, like, don't get me wrong. I, I am as much about chasing the, you know, the holy grail bucks of 30 inches wide or 200 inches. Um, and then if you can get one, that's both, that's even better. Um, but I'm definitely, I, I am definitely doing that. I can, you know, I can rack bracket. Here, here's a funny story for you guys. I'm sure a whole bunch of people are, what kind of trophy hunter are you? I can rack bracket uh, most bucks. Um, and, and the only time it gets hard for me is when it gets like well over 200 inches because nobody, nobody looks at that many bucks uh, that big. You know, the only guys who do that are guys like, Guy Eastman and Roger Selner, who've had the opportunity to look at all kinds of them for years and years and years in the magazine, you know, and so that um, that's a challenge once you get past that, you know, that 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 210, 220, you know, it's really hard to judge that. Like, let's just be brutally honest. How, you know, Brian, let's be real honest here. How many uh, how many bucks well over that 210 have we actually found in public land and gotten to really glass? Mm-hmm. I mean, Not many. definitely a handful yeah. for me, but you're right. Once they get big enough, I can't judge them because I just don't see enough of them. You know, they, it's tough to put exactly. it into perspective once they go above 200 or 210. Like, I don't know what they are. Yep. I, you know, what's what does a 230 buck look like or a 240 buck? And I've exactly. seen some big ones over the years and uh, definitely take my my best guess at them. But you're right. They're tough to judge once they yep. get that big. And And so, like, I can rack bracket them. But when it comes to actually putting the tape to it, I'll defer to somebody who's good at putting the tape to it. Um, and I'm usually really pretty close. 
um, you know, but that's just a lot of practice at looking at a lot of different bucks in that 160 to, you know, 190 category. Cause I can, I can pretty well find, um, several bucks in that category and I'm going to hunt the one that's as close to 190. And if I can find one that's pushing that 200, oh man, I'm going to, I'm going to hunt that as hard as I can. Um, but I'm, I'm also at that point in life where I've realized if you find an old mature buck with a big frame, like what I found last year, you know, you, you're probably wise to take it. Um, because there's, there's a point where, you know, like I've gone through the long droughts, but if you're sure that this is a, a big buck, a big old mature buck, there is no, no harm in taking that. Um, and especially if you've got a whole bunch of bucks that you, and you know that that's the top end of the, of what you've done. Cause I hate like out twice in my, twice in my deer hunting career, have I said, I will, I will hunt one buck and one buck only. And neither time have I, did I score that season? Um, and, but that's cause they were world-class deer. That's what it takes for me to do that. It's, it's got to be like an exceptional deer to, for me to say, that's the only buck I'll shoot. Yeah. I'm with you there. Yeah. It's like, um, you know, and scouting tells us a lot of like, uh, yep. uh, you know, what kind of caliber of bucks in there and what is a good buck for the area, you know? And, and yeah, you can't set your sights too high to kill a 200 inch deer if they don't live in that country or if you you run into them. If you never saw one during scouting, it's tough to hold out for that. And yeah, I too yeah. Have, have got caught setting my standards too high and, and, um, yeah, I mean it's it's just tough. Everybody has to make their own decision, and it definitely gets easier the yep. more bucks you get under your belt. But the truth is, is I like to hunt deer. Like I like to hunt big deer. Like the fun for me yep. of bow hunting is getting to stalk and getting a play, and um, so I try to set yep. like realistic expectations for the season and for the area that I'm yep. hunting. And there's some tags that you yep. draw where it's like all right, this is a place where it's 190 or bust. Like, I've killed enough bucks. Like, this is a place that can produce giants. I've seen them in here. Yep. I've scouted them in here. I'm holding out, and if I eat my tag, that's okay. But there's other places like eastern Montana where, you know, 180-inch deer is a mega deer, and I've definitely chased them over there. But if you see a 170-inch buck, you better make a play at him. That's a dang nice buck exactly. for over there, you know? And so... Yeah, your expectations and your goals kind of have to to match the areas that you're hunting, the days that you have to hunt, and you have to be realistic, you know. Yep. And um, so so yeah, I mean, I think it's different for all of us in different areas and and uh, different seasons. But yeah, definitely realistic expectations. But but this season you started hunting um, later. You didn't get a chance to hunt that early season. So yep. how did this area differ that you hunted? Um, you had to hunt that like October first, I would imagine. Yeah, it was, it was the first week of October that I was in there. Um, there had, there had been some snow, but it had melted off. It was pretty warm. Um, and it was a, it was a really good hunt. It was a hard hunt. Um, in that the deer were definitely hugging tight. Um, they were hugging tight to the timber. They were not in the pine strips in the very top. Um, even though the buck I ended up killing, um, ironically, he is my best buck to date. Um, but he's, I ended up killing him in the cliffs, but he was working from one area to another, um, where, where he was, where he was, he was, he, he was hunting feed. Like I was hunting him, he was hunting good food. Um, and so it was, it was a transition type of thing where I, where I caught him. Um, but I knew he was headed there, but I'll tell the story of that here in a second. So he, uh, or so we, I went in, um, went in a couple of days before, you know, before I was really going to start hunting hard and, you know, didn't find anything, didn't find anything, had car trouble on the way. So didn't get in as early as I hoped. Um, and so then, um, since kept hunting, kept hunting, kept hunting and had a really, you know, had a really good time and it, it but it took me a while to find deer and now a lot of the deer were really far off and there was, close to where I was at, there was actually more pressure than I expected. Um, I've hunted this spot a lot and it's hit or miss whether there's going to be pressure in there. I, I, you know, some years there's, there's significant and other years there's not much. Um, this year, like I watched because it was so dry, I watched a horse camp pull out. Um, a guy went in and I actually talked to him on the ridge. He's a really nice guy. You know, he, he told me like, 
I I've hunted in here. I haven't hunted in here since 2019. He's like, but my, where I camp, there's two spots for me in this particular drainage to camp with my five horses. And he's like, I don't have enough water in mine. And the other spots taken by the other family that I know is in here all the time. And he's like, so I just can't do it. And I was like, man, I, I understand. He's like, so I'm going to go clear around to the other side and, you know, go, go in a completely different spot. He's like, but I came in here for the adventure and I got kind of an adventure riding in. And he's like, I'll go to the spot where I killed a 180 buck last year and it'll be a blast. I'm like, man, go for it. And so it was really kind of cool to see that camaraderie again. So we talked, it was over like, on the first, I think, or the second that I saw him. And so he was headed out. It was really dry. Um, but he hadn't seen a deer yet either. You know, he had, he had come in with a couple of days to look around too. And so he, he hadn't seen anything. And then, um, then I ran into another couple of guys. They were from clear from another part of the state and they had never hunted it. And so they hadn't seen a deer. And I was like, I had not seen a mature deer in about two days of really looking hard. I, well, I'll take that back. Here's another pressure piece of the equation. I found a, I found a heavy bodied buck. I never got a good look at his antlers because we, we had the llamas and I happened to pull my binos up and see them up on this. You know, they were, they were hugging black timber, actually, believe it or not. They were, they were not in any of you know, the Alpine type country, they were hugging black timber, but it was close to the top of a peak. And so looked up there, saw them, uh, they were in yellow grass, ironically too, you know, in the place you normally see elk. So something didn't sit quite right with me on that. And so looked up, saw them and looked pretty, um, looked pretty hard at him, but I wasn't close enough to get a, you know, like pick apart his, his headgear. And so my camera guy's digging to get the spotting scope out while I'm holding on to two llamas and holding my binoculars. I'm sure if anybody was watching, you know, from far away, they were getting a chuckle out of us. Um, and so, but the bucks walked across the hill and disappeared from my life forever. And so I never got a good look at him, but that was look that was looking pretty good right on the, right off the bat. But then I figured out why those bucks disappeared out of that space. There were two guys glassing from that peak later, later, and it turns out they were actually camping on top of it. And so, and they were hunting, right? One of them, one of those guys actually killed a really big buck. He and I are the only two I know of in that area that, um, that killed big bucks. I did not see what the other horse camp had. Um, but it was, that was about the pressure, but this was a really big area. So it wasn't bad pressure wise. Uh, I, I was really kind of expecting the orange army to be in there. Um, and so my camera guy and I, we kept, we stayed mobile. We kept looking. We were like, okay, we got to keep finding, we got to keep looking for a spot that's housing a lot of bucks. And I said, okay, there's no spot, but we're going to have to go down real deep into a drainage. We're not going to be glassing big. In fact, there's a real opportunity. We're under, under 1500 yards on most of like left and right i said so there's a real chance that something could come out and we're going to make a play um, because we haven't seen a ton of big deer but we're going to hunt tight because i gotta i gotta be close enough to a lot of these trees and these rock slides where i can make make something happen um and so sure enough i'm sitting on one side and i'm having to game the sun a little bit because just where we had two shoots, one was perfect for glassing. So my camera guy is not a lot, not a hunter really to speak of. He's, he, and he's, he's a really accomplished hiker. He came along, uh, along to document it and did a really good job. And so he, um, <laughs> he, he took it as a challenge to find the big deer. Um, and so, Hey, that, that noise from the helicopter isn't interfering, is it? No, I can hear it. It sounds like the military's moving in on you for Veterans Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that definitely means that somebody got life flighted. That's rough. Oh, um, oh, man, so I'm that's like two bad. blocks from the hospital. Okay. So anyway, so interrupted by a search and rescue or something. Um, but we, so we're, we go down and sure enough, he finds a bunch of does up in some cliffs. Like, how does that happen? You know? So he finds them and then I'm saying, okay, I'm like, well, I'm going to keep looking over here. And so I'm, I'm working, you know, kind of, I'm having to change my, my angles and look up to keep the sun kind of to my left, not shooting straight into me. And he whistles at me like, Hey, come over here. And sure enough, he found a couple of bucks and one of them was a really nice buck. Um, and 
it's he's actually 30 and a half inches wide we taped him out at about 185 um and so or ike actually ike wanted me to bring him in he's like we need to put a tape to that buck and so i taped him out at 185 and um this is after all this is done um and so i'm like we can't do it tonight he's over 700 yards out so i told i told my partner i was like we're 700 yards out we can't do this tonight um but we got out of the hole, went up and went back to camp and got up at 3.30 the next morning. And we had to circle all the way around. I used an old creek bed um, banking on that the wind would keep my, it would keep my wind below him um, in the chute because I knew what direction he was headed. And there wasn't much of a moon. So I didn't figure he'd be out feeding all night. Um, but I knew the dire- general direction he was headed. And so we... Um, we went down this chute and stayed in that creek bed. And then we got even more lucky because it's super dry. So everything's making noise, but there's a ton of elk in this country too. So we just sounded like elk moving all over the place. Then the next thing that happened um, is we actually ran into water in this chute. So the creek covered up a bunch of our noise going in and our wind stayed below. It stayed in the bottom of the creek. Um, so we got, we got lucky in that the plan actually came together how you planned. And so before shooting my, I, I tell, uh, tell my buddy, I'm like, Hey, let's, um, let's drop the, drop the backpack. And, uh, so drop the backpack, took snacks and all our relevant stuff. And we went, we went across the hill and we just sat there for a while waiting for it to get to be shooting light, but we're 200 yards under where I expected them to be. And, after how oh, we let shooting light come, we sat there for, we sat there quite a while. Um, we let shooting light come. And so then we just started slowly working the edge of these trees in the bottom. And I didn't know how close we were going to end up to him. Uh, if I had it to do over again, I might've stayed about 20 yards further back in the trees. Um, but we, we come around this corner and I had heard some noise up in the rocks up above us in the cliffs. And so I kind of expected that's where they were going to be. Sure enough, I pulled my binoculars up and said, there he is, and dropped down and, you know, shot him, and that's the rest of the story. It was, you know, went back, got the backpacks, and took care of business, and then went and got the llamas, and, by, you know, we split up because we started hauling camp and camp and meat and llamas and all that. So it was a, it was a long day. We got out that night really late, um, and it went pretty well. I, I haven't – you know, I had him checked, and so we'll see if what his age is. Um, I haven't called in in a couple of weeks, but I don't even know if they're processing that stuff yet. But we're, I'm definitely getting him aged. Um, so it was a it was a good deal. I'm uh, I was excited with him. Um, learned a lot in patience. That was a very sleepless night. But I mean, we started at three thirty in the morning, so I didn't sleep that long. Um, but it was it was a good hunt. I was really happy with really happy with the buck. Pretty. I'm pretty proud of him. He's up on the wall. So, ah, super cool. Yeah, congratulations, dude. What a great buck. Um, man, it's Thanks. just um, it's so wild that next level effort it takes. That three thirty in the yep. morning. That that plotting and planning. And if you don't make that move, you don't kill that buck. And I, I also think it's wild how um, you know how how we further our hunting knowledge in these locations. And so you had hunted this spot before, as you talked about the pressure. And it's amazing what we learn year to year, and you almost learn like where you can expect to see bucks and where you expect bucks to hang out. And, and this learning an area uh, uh, just pays so many dividends down the road. And it it's a combination between you know hunting spots you know uh, and, and also exploring those spots you know. Like when you go into a location you know, and maybe you've hunted three drainages in there is exploring the surrounding drainages. So now maybe you know yeah. five or six drainages in there or knowing like when you hunt this area where you put your camp and you hunt these five drainages now, but yep. but now all of a sudden you're not finding deer in there and so now you move your camp to another camp location where you can look at another five exactly. drainages in there. And so just furthering your knowledge in these locations, man, it pays dividends. And so like how many years have you been Those. hunting this spot, Scott? Oh my, um, I've, <laughs> let me count it up. I've hunted this spot in 2010, 2011, um, 2012, 
then there was a long break. Can't remember if I went in there in 2013 or not. Yes, I did go in there in 2013. Um, then I took a long break because I drew those elk tags. Uh, then, then I ended up going, going in there in 2019 and then now went back again. Um, so a lot of years of history. Yeah. yeah, a lot of years of history. Isn't that amazing? And, and so that spot where you caught that buck, like down in that tight basin, secondary living, like we've been talking about, it was a spot you knew. Mm-hmm. And you talked about you being yep. successful and another guy that was a good mule deer hunter being successful in there, and that's all you knew about. But it was due to your yep. knowledge in there. It was due to your time you had spent in there hunting yep. and learning that place and where you see bucks. It's just so crucial for uh, for being consistently successful. And there you go. You harvested your best buck to date, like hunting a location. You had hunted a bunch yep. and it is a combination between hunting spots, you know, and also not getting stuck in a rut and exploring new places, yep. you know, and, and, uh, trying to find new honey holes. But, you know, I find that same thing that a lot of my success comes from past years experience where, you know, I yep. learn where the bucks like to be or the does like to be or where they like to hang out. And you just almost go into places with more confidence where other guys will give in early because yep. they're not finding what they want. But but you have this confidence in this location because you know bucks like it in there. And so you know if you just spend your time and you keep behind your glass and you keep exploring these drainages, you're going to turn up a good deer. But it sounds like that yes. was crucial to you, you harvesting that buck. It, it was knowledge of the country. Um, then, you know, e-scouting then also knowing the difference in buck behavior october you know october first week you know into that into that second um knowing the difference and how they behave what they do why they do what they do um and then also knowing knowing where a lot of the hunting pressure goes to mm. um that helps um like and and then not getting discouraged just because you see a few guys too yes. um you know, Brandon had a rough one. I mean, where Brandon ended up this year, he had six camps. Like that, that, that is too much to make it work. Like if I'd have been with Brandon, like on that trip, when I saw that many people in there, we, we would have moved. Uh, I, I would have gone somewhere else. Um, and you know, but part of that is too, you gotta know, you gotta have A, B, C, and D you know, uh, and you've got to be willing to get very unconventional if you want to kill big mule deer consistently. And, you know, sometimes like part of being willing to kill big mule deer is setting your standards on big, impressive, um, like, I, like I said, I don't set it necessarily on a number, um, but big, impressive, mature and old. And if you want to kill that, you've got to be flexible, um, flexible to be able to outweigh people or you've got to be flexible enough to be able to move and say, you know what, this plan didn't work because, you know, according to the biologist, some of the research that we did on that, that mule deer film last year, the hunting pressure is about the same as what it has been for a lot of years. And a lot of people are saying it's worse and maybe it is, maybe the data will show that it is over the course of time. But I think what has displaced people recently is we've had a lot of fires. So that's has sent a lot of people to explore other areas. That's because, you can't go scout a spot that's burning. doesn't mean the deer still won't be there um, or even the elk for that matter. Like they'll show up back inside that fire. I, I've seen, you know, I had a fire about 10 years ago where literally I, I killed a bull in the middle of middle of where it had burned almost moonscaped that year. And I found one of the best bucks I've ever, well, that was actually one of the years I said one buck and one buck only. Um, and I, I found him right on the edge of that fire where it had burned. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a hard deal when you have a fire, it does displace people and it does move. And Western Wyoming has definitely had its fair share of fires the last few years that have, um, that have shaken up a lot of the places where people used to like to go. But honestly, another biologist that we talked to a while back said one of the best things that could happen to a lot of areas in Western Wyoming is for it to burn and grow some of that new stuff, um, new underbrush and things that mule deer really need. Because right now, a lot of Western Wyoming, unfortunately, is very conducive to high elk numbers, high elk density. Hmm. 
Yeah, um, you bring up some some crucial points there, like that being able to adapt on the fly, like that uh, to be successful, you have to be able to adapt to the conditions in which you're given. And and I've also noticed that with fires is displacing hunters. You know, like I had a have a place that I hunt in Wyoming, and um, you know there was a fire that burned in the wilderness. Now I can't be in the wilderness, but a lot of the residents can be in the wilderness, and I noticed a lot more of the Wyoming residents were hunting in there. And the guys that I talked to, you know, it was because of that fire and the place they normally hunted burned. So uh, I definitely think that that um, you're right on that point. But, yeah, you have to be able to to adapt, you know, adapt to those conditions. And if there is a lot of camps, you know, you you got to be able to move. But, you know, you also said, like, don't get discouraged. You're right. Like, you're going to run into guys uh, you yep. can't let it discourage you. You got to keep the faith that you're going to find a good buck. And, you know, the fall comes and goes so quick. Like you got to give it maximum effort when you have those days to hunt and when yep. you have that, that season. So, um, man, it's, it's a fun place. You get to hunt there. Like one of the funnest to hunt mule deer for sure. You know, um, and it, it's cool that you've developed these spots and that, um, you know, that you spend so much time scouting and then able to find these locations and go in and hunt them. Uh, it, it's really special to be able to hunt that that country for sure because it holds good bucks and it holds good numbers, you know. Yep. And um, yeah, so so it's a good spot to hunt. But, you know, there's spots like that all throughout the country. Like, uh, yes. I, I believe these these trophy bucks. Uh, like they live in in every western state and they live in multiple different units and as we're getting more pressure like like you have to be able to adapt your strategy like i used to be able to draw a unit g every year and go hunt it with my bow well it's gotten way more popular yep. and point creep has killed me to where now i can't even feasibly draw that unit anymore so i so yep. i've got to adapt and find new places and new units and so <laughs> like you run that program for eastman's tag hub and so like as we're coming into tag application season like there's a lot of great places to hunt deer if you just put in the time and research and yep. i know like even in today's day and age where tags are getting tougher to come by you know every year i'm able to come up with good tags and good places to bow hunt some places i've been before and a lot of new places but there's a lot of good places that hold good buck hunting still and and, and that's a trick is, is doing your research and like the big the best way to kill kill big deer is to be hunting you know like it, it sounds so simplistic but it's true and that means developing strategies so you can hunt hunt consistently um now you know there's if you want to do it really well uh, you know i've i've subscribed to mike eastman's four state strategy for a very long time and i think you're probably in a six state category if i remember our conversations from the you know from the past um but i've got i'm building points in nevada and it takes me a little longer than nevada to draw than you because i'm a rifle hunter uh, for the most part i'll if I have a good opportunity with my bow, I'll go do it. Um, you know, if you were to, if you were, to, if a guy like you were to say like, Oh, Hey, you should do apply with me for this, for this archery hunt. Yeah. I, I I'd say, okay, I'd, I'd leverage that, you know? Um, but that's not what I'm, that's not my bread and butter, so to speak. You know, um, I'd, I'd probably, you'd probably want to throw me off the, off the cliff. Cause I like to eat my Snickers too loud or something in tight <laughs> country with bucks. So, um, but you know, understanding what you want out of a hunt, you know, like understanding that, okay, it takes this many points to draw an archery tag, this many points to draw a muzzle loader tag, or understanding that in a place like Nevada, it's not a guarantee with a number of points. It's just, this just gives you better odds theoretically. Um, but because one of the, one of the curve records that that's going on right now in Nevada is that there were a lot of new applicants uh, for a variety of reasons. Like a lot of people are looking for opportunity and plus the people at the top that have been burning points are getting back into the system and so and with consistency and so what's happened is your odds are actually changing at the top because there's so many people at the bottom and because it's a random weighted system and so it's it's a it's a real uh, interesting paradox in a place like Nevada but it's still random you know so there's always a chance every year so I will either be buying points or applying in Nevada um, every single year. That's one of my random options. Wyoming is my other random option with my guaranteed general options. 
And so I also play the game in Montana. I'll apply there. I consider Montana to be a, a high odds place to go hunt. So I'll go, I'll go do that with regularity um, as often as I can draw a tag. Um, but with the full understanding that wherever I choose to hunt in Montana, um, I need to adjust my, I need to adjust my standards quite a bit in order to be effective and really do that. So there's, there's that piece of the equation. Um, and then, you know, I'm just, I'm reaching the point where sometimes it's just better just to save up some money and, 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 and buy some things. So landowner tags all across the West are on the table for me now. Um, I've reached that point in life where I'm like, mm, this is something that I'm going to look into doing. Um, I used to be like real kind of anti landowner tag, but now I've realized there as I've gotten into a lot of the why landowners want them, um, you know, I'm, I'm a lot more okay with that. And then I've also gotten okay with trespass fees for a variety of reasons. The biggest is that when you pay a trespass fee, you've got skin in the game. Um, you know, and there are still landowners out there who aren't going to charge you through the nose for a trespass fee, but they know that if you paid for it, um, you actually respect them enough to do it. You're not just looking for a handout. Um, and so there's, that's also, it also speaks to how you're going to treat their land. Um, which is a big deal. And so I think that's something to, there's something to be said for that. So it's having that, having the ability to look at your 30,000 foot, your 15,000 foot, and then right at your ground level strategy on getting tags and opportunity every single year. And you have to do it. You know, if you want to go and hunt, you have to do that. Western hunting has become even more popular. And I'm going to make a prediction. There are going to be a lot more guys looking for more opportunities in the Midwest because as things get tighter, they're going to look for more opportunities in places like that. But using Tag Hub to understand what each of these states has, what it does, and we're going to be expanding into, I, I can't believe I talked Guy into this, but we're going to have a lot of antlerless elk opportunities in there to research that because I know a lot of people, um, they'll go do cow elk hunts um, in, in units that they're saving their points for. You know, it may take them seven points to get an antler tag, but if the were to go hunt it twice before with a cow tag well guess what they've done their scouting and they went home with some meat yeah wow that's super cool yeah um so many good points there scott we do all have to build our own strategies and and you said something at the beginning there that um you know to become a good mule deer hunter you have to hunt mule deer like experience is the best teacher and so each and every year you have to get a tag and hunt somewhere and i i also think like um you know, guys set their standards uh, um, pretty high, and everybody has to build their own application strategy, but it does no good to draw a really good mule deer unit and not have any mule deer hunting experience. You're not going to know yes. what a big buck is or even how to hunt or find a big buck. And so the key is to have experience under your belt and, and have these tags every year. So so you can, you can go for some of these better tags when you're applying out of state because you have such a great home state that that you know you can count nope. on your deer tag each and every year, and you're going to be hunting big quality bucks there. And so now when you're applying in Nevada, you can apply for some of those better tags because if you're going to draw, drive nope. halfway across the country, you want to have a good opportunity at a good buck. Exactly. Um, you know, and, and, and I I also think that, that big deer can come out of – uh, uh, mediocre units or like you, you should see yeah. some of the units that I hunt that I hunt out of state there you know the majority or almost all the units I hunt are zero to three point units and I've killed some dang good deer yep. in zero point units over the counter units like yep. the, the key is building your hunting skill set and, and then being able to sort through the information to find the right population or to find, you know, that place that can produce big bucks, but maybe they're not known for it because these big bucks, yeah. you know, they, they don't have hard lines of where they live and where they grow up. And sure, there's really good yep. units that produce, you know, big bucks year after year, but a lot of these easy draw units also produce big deer year after year. And so that's like why the, the MRS and why the tag hub is such a good resource is because you're able to dive into the numbers. And so many of these States release such good statistics, like a uh, 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 four point bucks, like how many four point bucks were harvested. Like yep. you can go through um, like uh, uh, Utah's and like, I look like, even though I'm bow exclusive, 
don't think that I'm not looking at all your guys' rifle hunts, too. Like, I'm looking to see what your <laughs> harvest data is. And, you know, like the spot I want to hunt in Utah, they kill over 1,100 deer with rifles in there every single year. Like, there's good populations in there. But I'm able to sort through that data at Tag Hub and, and find those quality sleeper units that are those zero to three yep. point units. So I'm hunting mule deer each and every year, and I'm building my mule deer hunting skill set. You know, and when I do draw those good units, you know, then I got a dang good chance to to kill a big buck, and I I got a dang good chance to kill a big buck even in these low point units. But uh, that that's kind of the beauty of Tag Hub is just giving me so much of that information that. I burn hours of my free time sorting through it each and every state. And yeah. I also, like like uh, mule deer are my favorite species to hunt, but I also like to hunt big bulls, and I like to hunt antelope. Yep. And, and I can also find all that information in there as well. And so it just gives me such a good overall feel of the West and those states to where na- you know now I almost know that information by heart, what the good units are, what the sought-after units are, what the sleeper units are. And, and every year I've got a few units on my list you know that i'd like to check out or that i'd like to scout or that i drove through or that yeah. you know just the the research will point me towards it you know and so like gosh i mean for the 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 fee to 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 have all that information at your fingertips like i i, I really think it's crucial for western hunters to to have a resource like that and to start looking for out-of-state opportunities because there's a bunch yep. of them out there and And, you know, it's understanding the phase of life you're in, too. Like, okay, so I've got your past of the young kids phase. So I'm in the young kids phase. So right now I better be building points. You know, it's hard for me to go away for an extended trip too often because of the age of my kids. My wife needs the help. I've got four of them, you know. But I better be building up the points in the places I want to go hunt so that when they're older and it's a possibility to go, it can be done. You know, that's a, that's an important, it's an important thing to never stop building your strategy just because, you know, just because your circumstance in life is a little bit harder. You know, one of the, um, one of the bigger pieces of, of understanding that too, is that you can look at tag up and you can build a projected strategy. Isn't Nevada random? Yes. But if I see that application numbers are going up in a unit that I want to hunt, well, I'm just going to string that out a little bit longer and leverage how many points I've got, you know, uh, and, 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 and also understanding the, understanding the system. Like, you know, I'm speaking of Nevada because for everybody who doesn't know, I write the MRS for Nevada. Um, I have since 2015. And so understanding Nevada system is that it's, it's, it's a weighted bonus point system where it's a random draw. Um, but understanding also the number of passes, like Nevada looks at your entire application before it moves, whereas Colorado has first pass, second pass, and you know, and multiple things like that that you have to consider. So it's two completely different areas. So if you're going to build your strategy for hunting in Colorado regularly, or you're going to build your your strategy for you know Nevada, it's possible to hunt mule deer on a fairly regular basis, especially for guys like you with a bow. Um, so it's something to really consider and understand what you're doing, but then match it to the phase of life that, you know what, when your kids get a little older and it's easier to get away, guess what? You've got a whole slew of points built up for multiple States and you can go have some, have some good fun once that, that life phase changes a little bit. And, but a, a tool like tag hub helps you understand and project that on a much, on a much better level than, other places where, you know, it's okay, well, I'm just going to look at the data and guess, well, I can visually light that up. I can visually light up past hunter density. You know, that makes a difference. Well, do you want to like a state like Montana that has all kinds of over the counter opportunity for residents? Well, you know, the reporting shows where the highest hunter density was. Is that where you want to hunt? Or do you want to go hunt it? Because everybody else is seeing that it was high hunter density last year. So they're all going to run to a whole bunch of other things. I'll pick the spot that probably has a middle of the ground hunter density, but you know, there's, there's, you know, there's more than one way to look at it, but, and everybody's got a little bit different strategy. So, yeah, you're right. It's an individual strategy. And I like how you talked about where we're at in life too. And, and like you say, like now starting to get 
um, you know, the, the landowner tags. And that's something, you know, that I've just started to look at in the last couple of years and I haven't pulled the trigger on it, but I have a good understanding of the units now to where I know when it's a good deal or a good unit. And like, like my buddy, Tony treat, yep. he, he, he bought a landowner tag last year in a unit that he was hunting deer that he saw a great big bull in. And then he went and killed a great big bull on a landowner tag. There. Yep. Like he used that information and also, like, um, you know, hunting some of these out of the way states, like there's opportunities in Kansas and Nebraska and North Dakota yep. and Oregon. And, you know, that it's always expanding. And while you say I may have a six state uh, uh, tag strategy, like I, I may be 10 or 12 at this point, you know, because I just keep looking at, <laughs> at other opportunities in other places, yep. you know, and there's there's good deer coming out of those places, you know? So yeah, yep. uh, I definitely think like building your, your individual tag strategy and looking at some of these other options is smart in today's day and age, you know? And, and, and that's, you know, that that's how you find that good hunting or that next honey hole. And there's still so many good locations out there and good bucks out there and good hunting to, yep. to be had, you know, it, it's just about, um, you know, putting in your time and doing your research. And, and exactly. um, I, I definitely think, um, you know, Eastman's Tag Hub and the MRS definitely help with that. It's such a great resource. And also, you mentioned, like, understanding the, the states, you know. It's like yep. every state application and point system is different. And, and like, I remember early in my uh, out-of-state career, I remember – like I didn't have a lot of extra money, but there was one year where I applied yep. in Nevada, and I can't remember if I put in for the 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 PIW or the Silver State tag. Somehow I had messed up and hit the wrong button on my app where I bought <laughs> the hunting license that year and applied for a tag that I couldn't draw. You know, it's like uh, yep. just pretty much throwing money away when I didn't have much, you know. And so like understanding yep. each state and how it works and how you draw and applying for tags that you can actually draw <clears throat> in that state because, yep. um, you know, there's states where, you know, there's some units that don't even give non-resident <clears throat> tags where if you put your application yep. in there, it's pretty much useless. And so, like, the yep. the money for, for the subscription alone, uh, just knowing that you're not putting in for tags that you can't draw is, is worth it. Well, and put it put it in perspective like this, too. Like, I'm if you have a tag of membership, you know, and I'll sound – I'll go full bore sales pitch here, so I apologize, Eastman's Elevated listeners, but, you know, this is Eastman's Elevated podcast, so we'll, you know, we'll talk about it. Um, the discount page is my gear discount page. You can do literally do one order of Cryptek gear at 25% off. Um, and I'm using them because they're a clothing example. So everybody literally could use this. Um, you could do one order of Cryptek gear and save more money than the cost of an elite annual membership to tag them. And plus on top of that, um, right now we have had several deals going where we, we've been kind of going back and forth between an Alaska guide creations, bino harness. And then we've also had a combination of a bag of coffee and a Yeti rambler, you know, so kind of what you want. Somebody might be happy with their bino harness. So the, the Yeti makes more sense or somebody may say, Hey, yeah, I'd like that $110 bino harness with my membership. Um, so you know, there's a lot of benefits to being a part of that because um, we we are Eastman's exists to make hunters better hunters. I mean, I can guy hammer that home with us all the time, and so our goal with Tag Up was to help people have better hunts on a regular basis, do better on those hunts, and then help them be more comfortable, which makes them better hunters through this gear discount program. So, you know, it's for me, it was, it's been a really fun journey to work on that. And we're, we're going to be very aggressive in um, expanding some of these discount opportunities. And we, we did some pretty cool brainstorming on some brands that we're going to work with on, um, you know, free gifts when you subscribe. So definitely be watching because that is going to be uh be kind of some some game changer type stuff that everybody will be very happy with that they look at um and see as part of their subscription to eastman's tag of 
Yeah, super cool. And I also like that um, continuing to evolve the system and the the yep. information in there, and it isn't the same information year to year. Like, it changes, and you guys put a bunch yep. of time and effort into each state and those units and, and, and changing them up with a, what's a blue chip unit and a, a green chip unit and really yep. uh, diving through those statistics to give guys the, the best information. So, yeah, man, it's, a, yep. it's an awesome program. And and um, I can't wait to see where it goes in the future. But, um, man, I always enjoy getting you on the podcast. Can uh, can you believe an hour already went by? I can because we were talking mule deer. <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's that's usually – that's our uh, – our preferred topic usually when we get together is to talk mule deer. It is. But, um, dude, congratulations on that great buck this season. Hey, thanks and congratulations on both of yours i don't know that we even got to talk about them yet i i, I feel bad now i uh, kind of monopolized your time to tell me those stories too no that's uh that's why i had you on the podcast um no it was great scott thanks a bunch man i really appreciate you and appreciate everything you do for eastman's all right guys that's a wrap fun conversation with scott uh thanks again for him taking the time from his busy family to um join me on the podcast and talk what we always talk about talking mule deer so um man it's just been so fun it's been a heck of a season here um finally winding down but uh i talked to somebody the other day and um they said yeah you've been hunting from uh july all the way to uh the end of november july to december and um they're right <laughs> i have been on some amazing adventures um this has just been a wild season been able to to manage everything with the help of my crew, the help of um, my wife, kids, and everybody, and um, just go out and really stretch my legs and see what I'm made of. So I uh, just couldn't be happier. My um, my cup is full. Um, I, that was a combination between filled and full, but um, it really is. I just had these wild adventures, put on a bunch of miles, hunted hard like I wanted to, uh, made some mistakes, I learned from them, um, but also made some good moves and made some great shots and um, just a wild season. And so, um, you know, I still may have a January in the works. I've got to get back to the grindstone here and get my life organized. My garage has just been a wreck here. And, um, yeah, get my life organized and uh, get back, get some work done, and um, we'll we'll see about that January trip. But for now... Um, Back to the grindstone and um, back to training, you know, back to um, getting it good miles and um, shooting arrows and um, just trying to put in that work to um, guarantee my success next season. Um, man, that's what it takes. It's just constant effort and um, it's living this this um, bow hunting lifestyle 365. So, yeah, back on it, back on the trails, uh, just trying to find that that motivation again and um, just starting to get after it. So, yeah, it's been day in, day out. I've enjoyed the training, enjoyed spending time with this new bow. This new bow is is amazing, this um, V3X. Um, shorter axle to axle than I'm used to, but that thing is just shooting for me. Um, so I've been working with that quite a bit, and... Um, yeah, just um, in enjoying the season. Uh, man, it sure was fun. So I, I hope you guys had a good season. I hope you guys got out for some good adventures. Uh, I know I enjoyed it. And, um, man, thanks again to Scott. Thanks to Eastman's, our sponsor for today's show, Zamberlin Boots. Again, I love those 215 Salute GTX RRs, and the boot I like is the 320 Trail Light Evo GTXs. Uh, if you're in the market for some new boots, make sure to check them out. Those things are money. And, um, yeah, with that, get you guys some good podcasts, man. I've been recording like crazy, getting on some really good guests, having some great conversations. So try to get you guys that content to help improve your hunting. Um, it, uh, it really does shorten the learning curve. Um, you know, for me, when I can have these great conversations and, um, um, you know, hopefully for you guys listening in that, uh, you pick up some tidbits that you can put in your, in your tackle box for next hunting season. So, um. Man, it's just awesome. Thanks, you guys, for all the support. I appreciate it. That's a wrap this week. I'll check in with you guys next week.